God's word here tonight a little bit. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus loves you. Amen. Jesus loves you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise. Say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, but you need him more. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jeffrey said, I'm not doing that, Pastor Mark. I've got a good marriage. Amen. Don't mess it up. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jeffrey didn't have to know me very long before he realized that I might not be a good influence on him in his marriage. Amen. <laughs> We're just kidding. Okay, folks. We love the Lord. Okay. Amen. Praise God. In the Bibles, in the book of, in your Bible, in the book of Judges, Chapter 7, verse 19, Brother John, I uh, start with verse 1. I'm going to start, no, excuse me, no, you're right, verse 19. <laughs> God bless you. Hold on, Brother John, if you can with me here. You turn my mic up just a little bit, and I'll back off of it. Judges chapter 7 and verse 19, of course, I know that you've heard of Gideon before. You've heard of Gideon, amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I was uh, I was uh, preparing for uh, my message. I, I had a lot of doctor's test this past week. I tell you, how I many know tests can wear you out? They just wear you out. The prepping for tests and the tests just wear you out. And uh, so I, I started this message uh, that I preached this morning on Thursday because they're trying to get ahead because I knew on Friday and Saturday I would not feel well. And uh, and so I had the scripture uh, that, that God had given us, not fear not, that God's with you and he'll strengthen you, he'll help you, bless you, he'll comfort you, you know, out of Isaiah. And uh, it was, I believe, Friday night, Thursday night or Friday night. I don't know. Sister Terry texted that same. She said, God laid this text, this verse on my heart. And I just want to text it to you. And I said, I just put that down on my notes. Hallelujah. Boy, God's good. Amen. God's good. That's how he works. Praise the Lord. Judges 7 and 19. So Gideon and the hundred and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. And then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand for blowing, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. I want to minister tonight just a little bit on that thought, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. This will be part one. Lord willing, next Sunday night, I will deal with the second part. Amen. Praise God. I find that sometimes I can be a little long-winded. I know you don't believe that. I know you don't. I, I realize that, but so I shorten this and condense this, and I'll try to preach this in two parts, okay? Praise the Lord. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, in the name of the Lord, I thank you. Lord, for such wonderful presence. I thank you, God, for your grace. The morning message today, the, the service, God, your presence was evident. Father, we thank you. I pray your blessing on the body of Christ tonight. Thank you for them coming back to a Sunday night service. I know the devil doesn't want people in service. The devil doesn't want people worshiping God. But you do, and I thank you, God. I'm asking God for the unction and the anointing, Father. God, I want to stay humble before you, dependent upon the Lord. Touch these lips of clay, God. Cannot do this without you. Pray for the fire, the power, the passion. Lord, let us have his love and his zeal for you, God. Let us have ears to hear and receive of thy word. Penetrate our hearts, not just our minds. Change us, God. Transform us. Help us. Make us more like you, God. I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Praise God. A little bit, I'd just like to minister on the thought, the sword of the Lord. And of Gideon and Judges in chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight to the Lord. Now this will be a little bit different. Brother John's got the King James Version and I've got the New King James here. But it said then the children of Israel, that's the Old Testament church, the people that knew better, the people that knew the commandments of God, they knew God, they knew the laws of God, the law of Moses. But they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And we read this over and over throughout the book of Judges. There are six cycles with this. And you'll see as we study this back in our midweek service on Wednesday nights going through the Bible book by book. When we dealt with the book of Judges, you'll see that, uh, that they were serving God, they were following God and and then they went after other idols and they went the wrong direction. And, and of course, there were people that tried to warn them, tried to tell them, but they went the other direction and they wouldn't listen and heed the voice of God. And, and so what would happen is they'd become in bondage and oppressed by their enemies and they would get sick and tired of being sick and tired and oppressed by their enemies. And they'd cry out to God. And when God saw that their hearts were truly repentful, uh, it wasn't just words coming out of their mouth, but when God saw that their hearts were truly repentful, then they, he raised up a judge and would deliver his people. But we read this over and over throughout 
the book of Judges, we see this as a pattern. Israel would once again go their own way rather than following the ways of God. Now listen, it seems that the Israel as a whole had a hard time learning the lesson whenever they would disobey God and go their own way and do their own thing. They would find themselves being oppressed by their enemies. I want you to listen to what I'm saying here tonight. They were oppressed by their enemies. I believe that a lot of lives are in mess today because of this one thing. Let me tell you what we're ha what's happening here. They're doing their own thing. They're going their own way. And the devil gets a lot of blame for things that he has nothing to do with. Can I hear an amen out of this? Listen, my beloved friend, people can make foolish choices over and over and over and over again. And sometimes it's hard for us to learn our lesson, especially when it comes to finances, especially when it comes to spending. We overspend and and we spend in ourselves and we spend in our pleasure and we have nothing left to give God, nothing left to bless other people with. Can someone say amen to that? My, I, I know that through the years and trying to raise my family and on such a low salary and uh, and so, you know, our debt had begun to rise up and you got things you got to get. And I don't like being in debt. I don't want to be in debt at all. So my wife and I, we have labored. We have worked hard for the past uh, two or three years. We have, we have put money down and put money down and put money down and put money down down and put money down because I know that God doesn't want me to be in debt. I'd rather do without than to have myself full of debt. My wife and I next month will get ready to get, we're about to finish off paying off $35,000 that we worked off because God doesn't want us in debt because that's not a good testimony unto the Lord. But people get themselves in bondages and financial problems because they do their own will rather than following the will of God. God is simply trying to gain your attention and bring it back to himself. You can just read it the havoc, the confusion, the chaos, the problems and the turmoil and the pain and the misery. Yes, some of this can be the attack of the enemy coming against those who have consecrated their lives to God. You desire to draw closer to the Lord. Sure, we know that Satan does attack and try to oppose and suppress the children of God, but most of it can be because of our own doing. We don't like to admit it. We don't like to confess it, confess it, but a lot of times the things I've suffered were because of choices that I made not following the will of God. You're never going to change. There will be no change in your life until you recognize, God, it's me. I need to change. I need your help. And God isn't going to help you until you sees that you're trying to help yourself. God told me that many times. I'd cry out to the Lord, and I'd say, God, get me out of debt. I don't want to be in debt. Then turn right around and buy something out, not buy. God said, I'm not going to help you until you get serious about this. I said, God, I've repented. He said, you hadn't repented until you quit buying. I'll tell you the God honest truth. I tell you the truth. And when I did that, God began to turn things around, began to help us. Amen. I tell you, folks, God's a good God, but you got to do your part. We get in the buy, and then we cry out to God, ask him to deliver us. God can deliver us. God will deliver us. But God just might want to make you work it off. You guys are getting quiet tonight. I don't know if I'm hitting on something I ought not be hitting on, but you might be getting quiet tonight. But a lot of it's because of our own doing. We have nobody to blame but ourselves and the choices we make. This was Israel, the people of God, the Old Testament church. They had no one to blame but themselves. No one to blame but themselves. Now when we look at some uh, uh, someone in our own eyes, we might not see much, but when God looks at them through his eyes, he sees potential. Turn to the person next to you and say, God sees potential. Amen. God sees potential with God, nothing's impossible. God is just looking for a vessel that he can mold and fashion into his likeness. Let that vessel be forged in the hands of God and you'll do great exploits for God. I'm telling you, I don't care who you are. God's no respecter of persons. God can use you, lay his hand upon you, anoint you with the Holy Ghost and power. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God wants to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire and with power. We are a Pentecostal church. We ought to use what God's given available to us. We have the word of God. We have the Holy Ghost. We have the fire. We have the power. We have to believe God and trust God and know that God can do great exploits to those that will believe him. Well, through this century, as God's molded those vessels through trials and hardships and difficulties, it doesn't come easy. You say, I want to be used by God. Well, get ready to go through the fire. Oh, pastor, I want to be used by the Lord. Get ready to go through the valley. But, oh, pastor, I want to be used by God. Get ready to go through the desert. Get ready to go through some dry times. Get ready to be purged. Get ready because God is going to bring you through some hard times and difficult times to shape you and to mold you and to forge you into the vessel for his glory. It doesn't come easy. It doesn't come quickly. Oh no, there's no quick microwave solution to this. It doesn't come without pain. It doesn't come without hardship or difficulties or sorrows. 
But when God was finished, they were used mightily for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? I'll just give you an example that the very messages I preached last Sunday morning and the messages I preached this morning, I could not preach if I had not been going through some very, very difficult times in my life. Satan likes to attack my health. I realize that, and I know that. He tries to attack us in many ways. He tries to find your weakness. He comes at an opportune time. For me, it's my health. He tries to attack me there and put fear into my mind and thoughts to not believe God and trust God. I realize that maybe some of you have gone through things that also yourself, and you know what I'm talking about. But listen, a lot of times God will bring you through certain things so that he can prepare you to minister to his people because you got to go through some things before you can say something things. You got to experience some things. You got to go through some hardships. You got to go through some trials. If you want to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you better make sure you're called to God and you're not calling yourself because you're going to go through hell and high water. You're going to go through highs and lows. You're going to be lonely. People are going to forsake you. They're going to spit in your face. They're going to cuss you. They're going to hate you. They're going to love you. They're going to like you. They're going to despise you. They're going to turn against you. I'm telling you the truth. This is what happened. Jesus said, listen, the servant is not greater than the master. This is what happened to Jesus. He came to his own, and his own received him not. I'm just trying to tell you, some people think this is easy street. No, it's hard. I've heard experienced pastors that have been preaching for 40 and 50 years said that it's never been harder to be a pastor than it is today in this wicked and perverse generation and what we're living in. Then why do you do it, pastor? Because I have the call of God. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel necessities been laid upon me. What are you talking about? I live this church. It's not just, I know sometimes all the pastor, all he has to do is get up and preach on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, wing it. He doesn't wing nothing. Your pastor studies. I study hard. You can ask my wife. It's, it's all the time at home, at church, everywhere. Everywhere. Things don't come easy to me because I'm not that smart. I am not. You guys, some of you folks in here are smarter than I am. You are brilliant, and, and I'm not that smart. I have to study and study and study and study and study and prepare and pray over it. Why do you do that, Pastor? Because I care enough about you. I care enough about your spiritual condition. I want you to be fed. I want you to know God. I want you to know the word of the Lord. I want you to have the victory. I want you to live in the power of God. I want this to be a spirit of revelation to you, that you walk out of here changed. You walk out of here in victory. You walk out of here in the power of God, knowing who you are, knowing who Christ is, knowing the word of God. I want you to know the Bible. I want you to know God. God cares about you. I love God. I love the Lord. I want to, I'm doing this unto the Lord. You know everything we do, whether in word or deed, we are to do unto the glory of God. We do it for the Lord. I'm glad that you're here, and I want you to be here, and I pray God wants other people to be here too. But I tell you this, we do this unto God. Everything we do, whether it's cleaning the toilets or the bathrooms or emptying trash or ministering to the children or picking up or mowing the grass or painting or vacuuming or fixing or repairing places here at the church, we do everything for the glory. God, even at your home, when you do your dusting, your cleaning, your laundry, your trash, whatever you do, you do everything for the glory of God. God's given you a job to provide food on your table and clothes on your back and a roof over your head. But even at your job, everything you do, you do for the glory of God. You're a child of the King. You belong to the Lord. Your calling is a high call that comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Everything we do, we do under the glory of God and do it with excellence. Do it right. Do it with excellence. <laughs> Don't do a halfway job. Now, now we, see, we see the hand of God, the call of God upon Gideon. Now, let's take a look at Gideon. Gideon would be used of God to defeat the Midianites, and, and I pray that all Christians would desire to be used of God, to have the burden that whatever God wants in your life, that, that, that you're willing to do it. Say yes before you're even asked. I have a willing heart. I'm willing. That's what God is looking for, a willing heart, an eager heart, a teachable heart, an agreeable disposition, and he can use anyone that will humble themselves to his will. Those that are broken and contrite, those that have that kind of heart, God will not turn away from. God will not despise you, but that's what God is 
is looking for. People that will live for God and not just for themselves. We need to have the heart of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, and Isaiah saw the Lord sitting a, 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 sitting a high a, a throne, a high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the seraphim cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the Bible said that the house was filled with smoke, and it speaks of the glory of God. It really talks about the Shekinah glory of God that we ministered on last Sunday night. Oh, God, bring your glory. I don't know about you, church, but we can encounter the very Shekinah glory of the Lord. We had a little taste of it here this morning, praise God, when Jesus brought James, John, uh, the sons of thunder, and Peter up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They experienced the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied with some dusty, dead religious performance, but I want to encounter God, and I'm telling you that it's possible for the church to experience the glory and the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the glory of God came. And when Isaiah saw it, he said, woe is me, for I'm undone. He said, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I believe that's in verse 5. And then one of the seraphim took a live coal from the altar, and he touched his lips. And when he touched his lips, it cleansed and purged his sin away. And the altar that the live coal was taken from is a type of Calvary. Calvary cleanses. Only the blood of Christ washes our sins away. But after Isaiah saw the glory of God, after he had the revelation of God, he's got something to say. When you have an encounter with God, you have something to tell a lost world. Hallelujah. <laughs> the blind lead the blind, and they all fall in a ditch. Religious, dead religion has nothing to say but a church of people that have seen and have had an encounter with the glory of God. They have something burning in their heart. They have something to say. Praise God. Hey, do you understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. When you've seen the Lord, how you lifted up. When you've encountered his glory. When you had visions of God. When the Lord has opened up the heavens, you have something to say. I've seen him. <laughs> I've heard him. I know him. I know what God can do. He can save to the uttermost. He can wash your sins away. He can fill you with the Holy Ghost and power. God can heal. God can deliver. God can set the captive free. I know him. <laughs> Isaiah saw the glory of God, and after he had the revelation of the king of glory, and after his sin had been washed and purged, God said, whom shall I send, and who will go before us? I, I've noticed that all those that were touched by God, you read the New Testament, when they were touched by God, when they were healed by Jesus, when demons were cast out, when they were delivered by the power of God, when the Lord touched them, I noticed that everyone wanted to follow God. And not only that, but they also wanted to tell others about Jesus. You look at the woman in John. I'm sorry if I'm going to go off script here a little bit. Is that okay? But you go to the story in John chapter 4, and she met Jesus at the well. Her life was miserable. Her life was empty. She tried to fill it with one relationship after the other. But one glimpse of Jesus, one encounter with the king of glory. She put her old water pot down. Forget the old life. I'll pick up the new life. And she began to tell everybody about Jesus. Hallelujah. What an encounter with God. What about the demon-possessed man? Legion, multiple demons in him. And when God delivered him and God set him free, the man of Gadara, and when God delivered him and set him free, he wanted to follow Jesus sitting cold and in his right mind. You look at others that God touched when he touched the blind and they saw him. They wanted to follow him. People that have had a true glimpse of his glory and encounter with Christ, you don't have to beg them to come to church. I'm going to tell you the truth. You don't have to beg them. You don't have to coax them. 
You don't have to plead with them. They want to be in the house of God. They want to be where they can hear the word of God. They want to be in his presence. I'm not saying that you can only have his presence here. You can have his presence at home, in your bedroom, in your living room, in your house, in your car. You can have the presence of God. Listen, walls don't contain my God. Walls and barriers, they don't bury my God. They don't contain my God. No, he lives and dwells within our heart. You can call upon the name of the Lord, and God can open up the heavens, and you can have an encounter with the Lord anytime, any place. I've had encounters with God at Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Of all places. God can actually go into Taco Bell. <laughs> encounters with God at work. Encounters with God in my car. Encounters with my God here in the church, in my office, at home. Encounters with the Lord of glory. And when you have an encounter with God, you have something to say. And you can't hold it back is what I'm trying to say. You've got to tell somebody. And God cries out. And God says, who shall I send? And who will go before us? And Isaiah is going, ooh, ooh, me, Lord, me, Lord, me, Lord, me. Because I've had an encounter with God. He's a living God. He's a powerful God. I know him. I've seen him. I've heard him. I've encountered him. I've experienced him. I've tasted God. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And I've got something to say to a lost and dying world. Does Word of Life have something to say to Mary in Ohio? Does Word of Life have something to say to a lost and dying world? Have we seen God? Are we being religious? Have we seen the Lord of glory? Do we have a word? Do we have something to say? Come on, church. Hallelujah. Have you got something to say? Or do you feel dead on the inside, empty on the inside? Isaiah said, send me. And God said, go. You say, well, I want to be used by God. No, you don't. Oh, yes, I do, Pastor. No, you don't, because you have to give up too much. You have to give up too much of your luxuries. There's a lot of things folks can have that I can't have. That's okay. You can have them all you want, but I'll never have them. My life is this gospel. In this little church, oh, I'll get to that in a moment. Because the things the world despises, God does not. You see, what, what does this mean? I, I believe that God is looking for a people that have had a live coal set to their lips, a people that have been washed by the blood. He's looking for a people that have a heart for God, a people that are bent towards him. He's looking for a people that will be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire and power. Church, it takes time, but get filled with the Holy Ghost. Spend time with the Lord. Make sure your lamps are filled with oil and your wicks are trimmed and your lights burning brightly. A people that will say, yes, I'll go, Lord. Yes, God, send me. Yes, God, send me. Yes, God, send me. Yes, God, I'll go wherever you say. I'll go to the schools. I'll go to the children. I'll go to the inner city. I'll go wherever you tell me to go because there are souls that need Jesus. There's a wonderful lady that met me here out of Columbus one day this past summer. Wonderful lady. Lord, the, the presence of God. We prayed in my office, the presence of God. And she worked for the Center of Christian Virtue. I don't know if she knows I know this, but it was told to me by one of her coworkers, and I don't think she'd mind me sharing this. But she was asking about her ministry, and I began to share what, what we're doing. I used to, I told her I used to be in design engineering, worked at Exxon, and told her my background, my experience, and how we ended up here. I began to share with her our heart, our vision, and what we were doing, trying to reach kids and showing her pictures, showing what we were doing. Tears began to flow down her cheeks. The presence of God filled the room. We began to pray and cry out to the Lord. She was supposed to meet me for like 45 minutes. It was two hours later, two hours. And she said, Pastor, I don't know how you do it. I said, 
it's, it's just the Lord. I don't know how you sacrifice. It's just God. I don't really consider it a sacrifice. It's just the Lord. She went home. She went back to the office that same day. And this co-worker told me she got on the phone and she began to call all kinds of pastors telling her what was going on here in Marion about this church, about what we're doing. She either called her husband, I can't remember, she either called her husband or she went home that night and she began to talk to her husband about what we were doing here. And she just cried and cried and cried. And she said to her husband, she said, I'd like to think that I could do what that pastor is doing and leave everything and forsake everything we have and do what he's doing, but I don't know that I could. I don't know if I could. But if God touched you like he did Daniel, if God laid his hand on you, if God called out to you, I would hope that you would be willing to say, yes, Lord, send me. I've got something to say. You see, I used to not have something to say, but I got saved. I used to not have something to say, but I had a John 4 encounter with the Lord of glory. I used to have nothing to say until I had an Acts 9 encounter with Jesus Christ that knocked me down, saved me, filled me with the Holy Ghost. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Hallelujah. I used to have nothing to say until I had these encounters with my God, my Lord, my Savior, my Deliverer, my Redeemer. Hallelujah. I had no idea that God would call me to this. I had no idea that God would call me to pastor. I feel sorry for you folks sometimes that have to put up with me, and I'll be honest with you. I'm not perfect. Don't put me on a pedestal. You can respect the word of God. But God would say, Mark Malden, are you willing? Are you willing? God reminds me of times when I laid on that couch and the glory of God would come. And I said, Lord, I'll do anything you ask me to do. I'll go wherever you ask want me to go. I said, I'll die for you if need be. I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I'll die for you if need be. God reminds me of these times that I'm willing. My life is Christ. My life is God. My life is the Lord. Praise God. Thank God. Thank God, church. It's not just a Sunday religious thing, but it's life. It's a relationship with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. God is looking for a people that will say, yes, Lord, I'll go. I'll do what you want me to do. That's what it means to deny yourself and pick up your cross and to follow him. I don't know about you, but I'm learning. I don't have it all, and I make mistakes, but I want God. I want to learn. I want to be teachable. I want to be broken before him. I want to be used to the Lord, and I'm sure that you want to also. But God would call a man by the name of Gideon, and nobody from nobody. Where he had no college education, he never went to Bible college, never graduated from a university, and he was the least of his family, and his family was the least of his tribe. And Israel was suffering oppression from their enemies. But God would raise up a man, and God would prepare a vessel, and God would forge a vessel. When God called out to Gideon, he called him a mighty man of valor. At times, I, I mean at the time he wasn't, but God saw potential, praise God. Many times we look at our weakness rather than looking at his greatness. We look at our lack rather than looking at God's strength. We look at our inability rather than looking at God's might and power. Moses did the same thing when God called Moses. Moses said, listen, God, I can't even talk. I can't even speak. And Moses immediately looked at his inability. I've done it many times and I still do at times. Sometimes it's hard to believe God by faith. It's hard not to look at the circumstances. But we look at our inability rather than looking at God's greatness. Can I tell you, he's a big God and he's bigger than you. <laughs> God chooses the weak things to confound the wise and puts the same the things that are mighty. He can choose the foolish things of the world to put the shame the things that are wise. This is how God works. He, he calls who he wills. He chooses who he wills. He blesses who he wills. He will gift those who he chooses. Hallelujah. Praise God. Therefore, God calls a Moses who just went through 40 years of the desert. Forty years on the backside of the desert before he saw a bush that burned it wasn't depleted. 
40 years before he had this incredible encounter with God. Not 40 days, not 40 minutes. We can't pray 40 minutes. We have a hard time staying awake if the message is more than 40 minutes. Some people get up and leave right away after 40 minutes. 40 years on the backside of the desert. God shaping him. God preparing a vessel for his honor, for his glory. 40 years of the school of Christ. Uh, Paul would spend three years in the Arabian desert as God was revealing uh, his glory, his revelation of his word to him and the will of God. And we have a great deal in the New Testament because Paul Paul spent three years in the Arabian desert. John the Baptist spent most of the days uh, uh, in the desert till the day of his manifestation. But God used a, a man that had the spirit of Elijah upon him that had a word from God and would preach an uncompromising gospel of Christ, preparing the way for the Savior to come. Hallelujah. Praise God. God would use a Joseph that would be betrayed by his brothers, his family, betrayed by Potiphar, lied about by his wife, thrown into prison unjustly, but yet God was preparing a vessel for his use, for his glory. And Joseph would be the second most powerful man on the face of the earth. <laughs> Do you still want to be used by God? God calls a Moses who went 40 years in the desert. He calls a David who is a shepherd tending a few sheep on the backside, uh, hills of Israel. He calls an Amos who's a country boy. Nehemiah, he calls to, to build a wall around Jerusalem. God chooses who he desires and anoints them with his spirit and uses them for his glory. Are you getting this tonight? God is not limited by time. We know that he's omniscient. He sees past, present, future all in one shot. He already saw what Gideon was. A mighty man of valor. He calls him in the present tense. He he didn't say you're going to be a mighty man of valor. He called him in the present tense. This is what you are now. So start believing it. Start acting like it. Start living like it. Don't make excuses. Quit looking at your inability. Start living what you are. What God has called you. Word of life. Proverbs 23 and 7 says for as he thinks in his heart so he is. Quit listening to the lies of the devil and start looking at the greatness of God and who he is in the word of the Lord. Lord. We are Christians. We're saints of God. We belong to the Lord. We belong to the army of God. We're soldiers in Christ. It's about time we start believing it. We start acting like it. It's time we start living like it. Amen. Hallelujah. We are bought with the precious blood. We're not our own. We belong to the Lord. We're sojourners. We're in a pilgrim land, folks. We're just passing through. But one day we shall be with the Lord forever and eternity. You're a mighty man and woman of God. Now believe it and live by it. See, before God can use anyone properly. All right now. All right, here we go. Oh, just. This is a tough one. Most people aren't willing to do this. But before anybody, well, God can use anybody properly, you first got to remove all the idols out of your life. You got to get rid of self and get rid of all the idols in your life. They must be torn down, and that's exactly what Gideon did. Israel was steeped into false worship, worship of Baal. And they committed, they compromised and gave into it, and they knew better. They, they opened up their hearts to new ideas and new ways which are not of God. It was not of the Lord. It wasn't that you couldn't worship God. It's just that you got to worship Baal and God, which is a mixture. And they opened their heart up to new ideas, which were outside of the word of the Lord, outside of the teachings of God. And before God could use Gideon, the false idols had to be broken down. He destroyed that which was false. I want you to notice that Gideon didn't hesitate. You say, well, pastor, you know. He, he, he did it at nighttime. Who cares? He did it. Whether you repent in the morning or the afternoon or the evening or night, doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I thought he's kind of smart for doing it. He knew it was going to cause a hornet's nest. He knew it was going to be a storm. He knew it was going to cause a great. He, he knew 
that he could lose his life by doing this. He knew that he could be killed for doing this. You can be killed if you break down the idols. You bring down the idol, Baal will kill you, but he did it anyway. Folks, we can't be faithful if we got a sniffle. But he did it anyway. He didn't care what his daddy thought. He didn't ask his daddy's permission. <laughs> he didn't go to the mayor. Oh, you understand what I'm telling you here? He broke it down because he knew it was wrong. And God said, you need to tear down the idols before I can use you. And so he broke down. the. Uh, praise God that he did. Hallelujah. He broke it down. The false worship. They become, they, Praise God he broke it down. He destroyed that which is false. And some things we've got to destroy out of our heart and life that are false. False ideas. False doctrine. False religion. False worship. False teachings. False living. It all has to be broken down. God wants to rid anything and everything out of our hearts that doesn't belong to him. Is there anything tucked in the recesses of your heart that do not belong? to God that's not pleasing to the Lord you wonder why you don't have the victory you wonder why you can't hear the voice of God you wonder why you don't feel the presence of the Lord you wonder why this is going on it could be that there are idols deep in the recesses of your heart that you won't deal with lust, perversion, pornography why, why would you open your heart to go see uh, picture shows or movies or television or whatever, whether it be on your iPad, whatever, that has sexual perversion in it. Wives, why do you let your husbands watch that nonsense so it can plant, Satan can plant that thought in their mind so they can, they can think upon that and start thinking about other women and their bodies rather than you? You're okay with that? Do you know that men in the church today have a great deal of a problem and addiction with pornography? But they won't talk about it. I've had men come to my office in the past saying, Pastor, pray for me. I have addiction. I'm perverted. My heart. Pornography. Women, you wives, you like your men looking at other women? Men, you love your wives looking at other men? Hardly dressed or dressed at all? Putting thoughts of perversion in your mind? You're okay with that? Baal, idols. One of the major tools Satan uses against men is pornography. And men, he waits till you're weak. He waits till you and your wife have a fight. He waits until things in your marriage are a little rocky. He waits until the both of you are not exactly compatible. And he comes for the kill. There are pastors and preachers and evangelists and men of God that are addicted to pornography. And now you don't have to wait to buy it till you're 21 behind a newsstand of a store. But now you can have access to it anytime, any place, anywhere. And it's killing the church. It's killing your heart. It's killing your faith. It's killing your soul. We have no room for error in this. None. You have to deal with it. You have to take it down. You have to go like like Gideon and you have to destroy this idol because it's an idol. It's a God. It's a fix. I've heard, I've heard men tell me, Pastor, it's, it's, like a, it's like a drug. It's like a fix. I'm okay for a while, but all of a sudden it hits again. If you can't handle that phone, take a hammer to it. If you can't handle that computer, take a hammer to it. If you can't, listen, your soul... Jesus said, if your eye offends, you pluck it out. Well, pastor, that's not really what he meant. I think it is. It's rather you go into uh, heaven maimed than to go to hell. If your right arm offends, you cut it off. Do you know that in Iran, that if, 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 if they catch you stealing, they just shoot you on the spot. 
ta, 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 ta. Just like that. They just kill you. No court, no judge, no lawyer, no judge. They just kill you right on the spot. And, and, and Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It, it's rather that you go to heaven without an eye than to miss heaven. It's rather that you go to heaven without an arm than to miss heaven and end up in a lost hell. I believe Jesus was serious about this. That's how serious he is about your soul. That's how serious he is about sin. I, I, I got to hurry up. I, I got, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm chasing rabbits tonight. I, 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 but I feel like these are some of the things that have to be dealt with. Folks, we got to get serious about the Lord. You got to get rid and tear down some of these idols in your life. Don't play with them. Don't pet your golden calf. You got to deal with it. Quit putting it off. You got to get rid of it. If it's offending you, if it's tearing you down, if it's destroying your soul, get rid of it. Did you hear me tonight, church? You got to repent of it. You got to get it out of your life. Get it out of your house. Get it out of your heart. Get it out of your home. Get it out. The thing is, most men, you know what I'm saying? You're not serious about it. You're not serious. Child pornography? Oh, well, unless you're Hunter Biden. Evil or getting away with evil, but I'm talking about the church. Judgment begins at the house of God. <laughs> Folks, before God can use you, you got to get rid of the idols. God wants to rid anything and everything out of our hearts that doesn't belong to him. He's not asking that we serve uh, God in Baal. It must be Christ and Christ alone. Many times uh, we want to hold on to Baal thinking we can serve God too. We want to hold on to the false doctrine, false thinking, and be satisfied that God wants to rid of these things. Tear down the Baals in your life and let God fill you with himself. It's the truth that will set you free. And when God called Gideon, Gideon wanted to make sure that, that this was of God and not of himself. He tore down the idols. Was like God said, but listen, I, he wanted to make sure it's God. I don't blame him. I'd want to make sure it's God too. Before I'd go out and do something that seems completely insane, I don't want to make sure that it's the Lord. John said in 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Examine the spirits, whether they're of God, because there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. Gideon would put out a fleece. If the fleece was wet with dew and the ground was dry, we know we've got something going on here. And the next morning, if the fleece was dry and the ground was wet, then we know it's not a coincidence. It's God and he's directing your steps. Of course Gideon started out with 32,000 men and with that amount of people, anything looked possible. I mean, we can do a lot with 32,000 people. I mean, uh, uh, to have a church that big, to have that kind of offering every Sunday with numbers like that, who needs to believe God? With numbers like that, it's big business. Who needs to pray? I mean, you can give $1 a week, have $32,000 a week. So God would tell Gideon to let all the men who are afraid to, to go home. If you're afraid to fight, he said, now look, guys, he says, no, now we got to fight against the Midianites now. And uh, God's told us to do this. Now we're going to deliver God's people. He said, now listen now, just, we're going to have a church meeting here. And he said, now look, he said, now if anybody's afraid to fight, I tell you, I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to suspend you. I, I'm not going to dock your pay. I'm just going to let you go. 22,000 people got up and left. I'd be like, whoa, 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 let's talk about this. <laughs> we can renegotiate. 22,000 people got up and left. Yikes. $22,000 a week just out the door. <laughs> we just lost two-thirds of our congregation, but I'm sure we can still manage. I've got 10,000 left. I mean, 10,000 a lot of people, you know. And, but God says, you know what? Gideon says, you know what? You got too many. Wait a minute. God just lost 22,000 people. God says, yeah, I know, but you got too many. When all said and done, they, got, they reduced it down to 300 people. God says, look, when you go drink of the water, he said, he said now look, he said, if they get down on their hands and knees and, and they lap up that water like a dog, he said, I'm going to send them home. He said, but if they bring water up in a cup in their hand, he said, I'm going to keep them people. I imagine Gideon looking at all them people lapping up like a dog. He said, oh, come on, man. Come on, drink like this. Drink like this. Drink like this. And, and, and so... And so when it's all said and done, God says, well, there's only 300 people lap with their, with, with their hand. He said, that's who you're going to use. That's who I'm going to use to defeat the media. 300 people. I had 32,000. 32,000. 300 people. <laughs> now we have to trust God. Goodness gracious, now we're going to have to pray. 
they'll have to seek the Lord. Now they'll have to depend on God. And, and now that now they need him and they know they can't make it without him. God said this in Judges 7 and 2. The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand saved me. Have you ever imagined that God would say your church is too big? Your ministry is too big? You've got too many people? I've never had that problem. <laughs> never. <laughs> I, I don't preach as good as Gideon, I, I guess, but God will share his glory with no man. And, and it's God and it's God alone. Let's remember that God will sustain and God will hold it together. And God will do it with just a few that he chooses. Just like he did with Gideon when his 300 men. Many are called, but few are chosen. So what's that, what's that mean, Pastor? Many are called, but few are chosen. It means that God has called and given us the opportunity to be used of him, but not willing, many are willing to forsake all they have to be used of God. What is a prophet of man? To gain the whole world and lose his own soul. You know, the harvest is ripe. Pray for laborers because the laborers are few. It's always been a few. I don't know. Statistics say this. I don't know if it's true. I know it's not a word of life. It's better here. Three percent of the congregation carries the church. Not here. I don't know where we're at. I don't know. Maybe we're 70 percent. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. God will share his glory with no man. It's God and God alone. Now, now God, now, now listen, Gideon would, would take his 300 men and separate them into three groups, three groups of 100. Each would have a pitcher with a torch inside of it along with a trumpet in the other hand. And the three groups of 100 would surround the Midianites who were as numerous as the sand. They did this at night. 300 men going to an enemy that's as numerous as the sand. I want you to catch that. What would the odds outfavor them by? A thousand to one? They weren't alone. But God, you're not alone. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. But God, man, when you got the Lord on your side, you got God on your side. David, one man, inexperienced, but fights a Goliath. Doesn't have the armor, but he has the armor. He's wearing the whole armor of God. David, David, a young lad, 17 years old, that brings down an experienced giant. But God, you understand what I'm saying? But God, that's what God can do. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Oh, what would seem impossible attempt unless they had God on their side at the right time and the men would blow the trumpets and break their pitchers. At the same time, they were to shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And when they did this, the enemy became frightened and they were confused and they turned against each other and began killing each other. Gideon and his men also pursued those who tried to run and escape. And the day, that was the day that the Lord gave Gideon the victory. And I'm telling you here tonight, church, God will give the victory to those who will believe God and do the will of God. God bless his obedience. And God gave Joshua the victory when they marched around the Jericho walls for seven days. They marched one time for each day for six days. On the seventh day, they marched seven times. And when it was time they blew the trumpets and they shouted and it was a shout of faith. It was a victory shout and the walls came tumbling down and God gave them the victory and we'll have the victory every time if we'll do it God's way. If you'll follow God tear down the idols. Tear them down. Raised a nobody from nowhere. Can you imagine Gideon? 
You can't lead an army. You, you have no training. You're, you, what college did you go to? Did you graduate high school? What kind of experience do you have? <laughs> None. <laughs> well, what makes you think that you can go and start a church there? God. God? What, what makes you think that you're, you're God? What kind, of, what kind of experience have you had in starting churches and start, plant, pl start church plants and pioneering churches? None. <laughs> My first one. Well, what makes you, God? 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord, he can do it. God can touch a nobody from nowhere. And Amos was a country boy. I got to preach on Amos sometime. Country boy. But God touched the country boy and used him as a prophet to declare the word of the Lord. God touched a Jeremiah. God cut, touched an Isaiah. God can call and use anybody he so desires. God raised up a Gideon to do great exploits. If God can use a Gideon, if God can use a Samson, if God can use the shepherds in the field, then God can use you. And God can use this church. Hallelujah. I don't care how big or small. That don't matter. I don't care how many or how few. We serve a big God. Hallelujah. He's a big God. It may not seem like much to the people on the outside, but God is telling us that he can take the little that we have and God can turn it into an abundance. I want to tell you how God works. I'm a, I'll quit. I heard you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. See, this is how he works. Jesus doesn't go get a fish factory and a bread factory to feed the multitudes, he finds a young lad with five loaves of bread and two fish. He takes the little that you have, and, and then God blesses it, and it just begins to multiply. That, that's what I'm talking about. That kind of, you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? That kind of radical faith. That kind of crazy, radical faith that I believe God, that's the kind of God that saved me. That's the kind of God that delivered me. That's the kind of God that baptized me in the Holy Ghost. That's the kind of God that healed me. That's the kind of God that restored me. That's the kind of God I'm preaching. That's the kind of God I want you to encounter. That's the one I want you to experience. He can take the little that you have and he can use it in abundance. Probably over 8,000 people were fed with 12 baskets left over. I like leftovers. <laughs> why, why, why do you think, Pastor, that they had 12 baskets left over? I mean, why didn't they just eat it all up? Why 12 baskets? Why 12? Well, there's 12 tribes of Israel. God uses the number 12. <laughs> A lot in the Bible. But 12 baskets. I think that Jesus wanted to show them that God don't lack supply. I think Jesus wanted to show them that God gives in abundance. Hallelujah. Glory. He's an abundant God. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Glory to God. Glory to the Lord. God, with God, nothing's impossible. <laughs> Abby, come on, this can help me if you come on. <laughs> I, aren't you glad I did this in two parts? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God, Pastor. Have faith in God. Believe God. Don't despise the small things. Be a willing vessel. Say yes before God even asks you. I, I, I use the faithful. If you commit to something and, and you see it through, and you're a man or a woman of your word, and you even have to give up some things to make sure that it gets done, that's who I look at. 
those kind of people get things done. They're committed. My wife and I, how many wedding anniversaries have we had on a Sunday or a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night prayer? Doesn't matter. We'll celebrate the next day. I, I have a wife that said, listen to this. <laughs> when the call of God came upon my life and when things were happening so quickly really in our lives, and we didn't know where this was going to go when we, I'm going to give up my job, my career, my, my retirement, my health insurance, all my security is world known. I'm going to give it up. We don't know how we're going to make it except God. We don't know how it's going to happen except God. And I asked my wife about that. What do you, what do you think about that? And she told me, and she told me with a sincere heart. She said, I'll live in a ditch with you. If that's what it takes. That's what we're talking about. For a woman that has trouble camping, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> but her heart is saying, wherever God leads us, I'm willing. When times get tough, when times get hard, when we're being squeezed on every side, God uses that woman to keep me straight. God uses that woman to talk sense into my mind and my heart. God uses that woman to take the scriptures. When I want to make a decision because I'm upset, because I'm angry, because I'm frustrated, because I'm disappointed, because I'm hurt, because I'm discouraged, my wife says, did you pray about it? And I'd say, I don't want to pray about it. his hand upon him, place his spirit upon him and use him for his glory. Praise God. What success, Pastor? How much you've achieved in life? No. What success, Pastor, by how much you have in your retirement? No. What success, Pastor, by all the monetary things you've collected over the years? No. No, that's not success. What success, Pastor, by how big your church is or your ministry or how many people you reach? No. That's not success. What success, Pastor? Doing the will of God. Wherever he puts you, wherever he places you, numbers don't matter, but doing his will does. Praise God. Let's stand together tonight. Because we're successful. If this is where I live and die in this church in Marion, Ohio, this is where I'm successful doing his will, feeding his sheep, reaching the lost. Praise God. Hallelujah. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you tonight. Men and women, nobody looking around, please. Private matter. Perhaps you're one that's been struggling with the temptation of addiction. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Men and women on both sides, you know what I'm talking about. There are idols in your heart, in your life, trying to bring you down. I won't think less of you. I'm praying for you. Because I know the tactics of the enemy trying to destroy you. But, but if that's you today and you say, Pastor, I just need you to pray for me. I do struggle. 
I need victory in my life over certain idols. Just pray for me. Just, just reach up your hand real quick. Just pray for me, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. I've got some honest folks here tonight. Anybody else? It's okay. I'm not going to call you up front here. I'm just going to pray for you. Anybody else? Men and women alike, the devil's been trying to bring you down, trying to destroy you, tempting you, trying to cause you to have idols of addiction. Come on. Bring it before the Lord tonight. Maybe there's some folks here tonight say, Pastor, I want to be used of God. Whatever the cost, whatever the price, I just want to be used of the Lord. Would you raise your hand tonight? Thank you. I see hands all across here. Yeah, I believe that. I'm so thankful. Do you know how much God loves you? I know the devil wants to destroy you, but I know that God loves you. I know that God loves you. I know he loves you. I want to pray for you tonight. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. I just want to pray for you tonight. You're more than welcome to come to this altar and pray. You're more than welcome to. But I just want to pray for you tonight. I want you to be real honest with the Lord. I want you to confess it to God. I want you to take it to the Lord as I pray for you tonight. Whether responded or not, or whether there's issues in your life and your heart, I want you to know that your pastor loves you and your pastor is for you. I want you to know that I don't want to see you. I want to see you get the victory. I want to see you be released from the powers of darkness and the temptations of Satan. I want you to live for the Lord and for his glory. I want the Lord to touch you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the name of the Lord tonight, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for your presence. I thank you, Lord, for this time that we have together, God. And I believe the Holy Ghost has spoken some things into our heart tonight that need to be spoken. Some things may be a little touchy, maybe a little sensitive, but God, these things need to be said. They need to come out into the light. We have to deal with them because, God, if there are some idols in our life, if there are some things that are holding us back, then we need to get rid of them. We have to destroy them. We can't pet them like the golden calf. We can't think that it's a misunderstood friend. But we have to realize that it is an enemy trying to destroy our soul and bring us to a lost and dying hell. And so, Father, we confess it to you right now. God, I bring my life, my heart, I bring it all to you. Every vice, every bondage, every addiction, I bring it to you, God. In the name of the Lord, every perverse thought, I bring it to you in the name of Jesus. And I'm asking you, God, to touch my brothers and my sisters and to deliver them by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus that breaks the yoke of bondage, that breaks every sin, that breaks every shackle, that breaks every jail cell door, that delivers and sets free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I accept and receive it. The power of God, the deliverance of Jesus. God, I lay my heart and my burdens to you. Oh, Jesus, I'm asking you for forgiveness. And I pray that you would wash me and cleanse me. God, help me in the name of the Lord to turn away from it. God, by your power, I have choices I can make. And I choose to serve God. I choose to live for God. I choose to live righteous. I choose to live holy. The power of the blood can keep me. The power of the blood can keep me. And I pray the name of the Lord. Satan, you cannot have them. Satan, you are defeated. Satan, your day is coming. We're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Satan, these children belong to God. They belong to Jesus. They're covered by the blood. Jesus, Jesus, God Almighty, deliver and touch and minister. I give my heart. I give my all. I surrender. I repent. I turn away from it. And I live for God. God, I pray for the body of Christ that we're willing, God, that whatever you want, whatever you desire, I'm a willing vessel. Lord, as Isaiah had a true encounter with the living God and saw the glory of the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, 
And the live coal that the seraphim took from the brazen altar touched his lips. And he was purged and cleansed. And God said, who will I send? Who will go before me? And Isaiah said, send me. Let us have that heart and desire, God. Use me, God. Send me, God. I want to be used of the Lord. I give it all up for God. I give my life. I give my all. I surrender my all. Jesus, God, my life belongs to Christ. God, you're going to use these people. You're using these people. God, you're going you're gonna to bless them. And, and God, they're going to have a message and a word that they're going to share to a lost world. Because of these encounters that they have with the Lord, they've got a message. They've got something to say. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. But God, you're raising up laborers now. Lord, you've got a remnant people that you're putting together in these last days that are going to have courage and boldness and they're going to be full of the Holy Ghost and fire. And they're going to know God and they know your word. And they have these encounters with the living God. And they're going to see your glory. They're going to encounter the glory of God. And they're going to have a message to say to others. And they're not going to be afraid and they're not going to be ashamed. And they're going to declare this message of hope and of salvation and of the gospel to a lost and dark and dying world that's infiltrated by Satan and demonic powers and spirits. But the light of Jesus will go forth from his church. Hallelujah. I believe that, God. I pray in the name of the Lord in these last days that you'll raise up an army, that you'll raise up a people. Call oh, God, raise up your church. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lay hands on someone next to you. Lay hands on someone. Pray for them. Lord, raise that person up in the army of God. Raise them up for your glory. Raise them up, God. Raise them up, Lord. You've raised up a Gideon. You've raised up others, Lord. You've raised up a Samson. You've raised up a Moses. You've raised up a John the Baptist. Uh, uh, God, you've raised up others to, to declare the word of God. You've raised up a Deborah. Oh, hallelujah. You've raised up a Jeremiah, an Isaiah, a Malachi, an Ezekiel. You've raised up a John. You've raised up others, God. Hallelujah. You can raise up people here. You can raise up this church, God. You can raise up a an army. You can raise up a people that have a message. God, anoint my brothers and my sisters. Bless them, God. Anoint them. Touch them. Empower them. I pray, Almighty God, that we not look at our inadequacies, but we look at the greatness of God. For you're a big God. Hallelujah. Glory. 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 We serve a big God. We serve a big God. Touch my brothers. Anoint them. Bless them, help them, strengthen them. Oh God, my Lord, Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah. Take down every idol, Lord. Come clean with Jesus tonight. You'll walk out of here changed. You come clean with Jesus, you'll walk out of here different. Hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to the Lord. Jesus, praise God. I love you, Lord. Oh, those chains fallen. Let them fall off in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I love you. I am for you. God is for you. I love you. I am for you. God is for you. I want you to hear it again. I love you. I am for you. And God is for you. Chains fall off. Chains fall off. Baal fall down. Hallelujah. Break down the idols. Break down the chains in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. My God and my Lord, I praise you. I worship you. I exalt you. I magnify you. Hallelujah. Lord God. Chains are falling off by faith. Shackles are falling off by faith. Bondages are falling off by faith. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Purge me. Oh, Lord, touch my lips with the coal that comes from the altar. Jesus. Oh, Lord God. Hallelujah. Jesus, Almighty God, my Lord, oh, there's an army rising up. Jesus, hallelujah. God, 
raising an army. God's raising a remnant. God's raising a people for him. Please get it, church. Please get it. church. Amen. God's made it for us. Praise the Lord. Praise God. If you give the devil a black eye, okay, in the name of Jesus, if you don't let him have his way in your life, in your family, in your home, in your marriage, in your children, or in you, we have the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Isn't that good? Isn't that great? Hallelujah. I'm used, I want to be used of God. I want to be used of God. I couldn't think of any greater calling any higher calling than to be used of God. That's it. You listen to me. I'm going to say this tonight, and I'm really going to quit. But I'll say this with love, but I'll say this with boldness. You better make sure that the track you're on is the will of God. You better make sure that the track you are on is in the will of God not your will. You better make sure. Glory. Amen. Brother Larry, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight? Is that okay? You feeling okay to do that? Okay, brother. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, church. Wednesday at 7, we have our midweek service. Praise the Lord. Praise God. You have a great week. In your journey, in your relationship with Jesus, if God has given us some things to think about, then let's, let's think about them and pray over them, okay? But you have a great week and stay safe. My wife and I will be back Thursday afternoon. Just going to get a little rest. Praise God. God bless you. We love you. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and give you peace.
May his face shine upon you. 